Hello everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining. There is an echo. Uh, hello. hello everyone. There is an echo. Samira, could you please uh, turn on? Hello? We still have echo, man. Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, sorry, everyone, for the technical uh, technical issue. Uh, uh, we will we will fix it uh, momentarily. Okay. 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 It's still at the end. Uh, let me go with the with the intro, woman. Then go go for it. Okay. All right. Uh, so sorry, everyone. Uh, our uh, technical issue that we faced. That's uh, it's a great pleasure uh, for us to have. Uh, uh, Dr. Samira Rahimi with us today. Uh, uh, it's, uh, she's going to talk about a very interesting topic, uh, the application of um, artificial intelligence uh, in uh, uh, primary healthcare settings. Um, uh, so before we start, I would like to go over a few housekeeping notes. Uh, if you have any questions during the presentation, uh, please write your question in the Q&A box. Uh, uh, let me just share my screen as well. Okay, in the Q&A box. So if you have any questions, use the uh, question box to ask your question. We also have a, a poll. Uh, you can participate in this uh, poll and then share your thoughts and feedback uh, with us. Uh, don't forget that our next speaker is Professor Derek uh, Rosenweig from uh, uh, McGill University, Department of, Department of uh, Surgery, um, who will be talking uh, about the applications of 3D bioprinting in Moscow skeletal uh, tissue engineering. Uh, if you, if you, uh, 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 you can follow us on on Twitter. Uh, our handle is translbme to uh, to get most up to date information uh, for these e seminar series. Also. Um, I'd like to uh, to thank our uh, sponsor, Montreal Transmedtech Institute, who has been with us since the beginning of this uh, e seminar series. So, with that, oh, Sam. yes, is the echo gone or yes? Okay, so I can take over and then. Okay. Please. Okay, this is a great pleasure for me to introduce uh, Professor Samira Rahimi today. She is an assistant professor in the Department of Family Medicine at McGill University, associate academic professor of Mila Quebec AI Institute, associate member of Electrical and Computer Engineering Department of McGill, and affiliated scientist at Jewish General Hospital. She is elected society officer of Canadian Operational Research Society and director of artificial intelligence in family medicine. Professor Raimi is a uh, fond de recherche du Québec Santé, FRSQ Junior One Research Scholar in Human-Centered AI in Primary Health Care. With an interdiscip interdisciplinary background, she is interested in the development, evaluation, and implementation of decision support tools and patient decision aids, as well as integrating human-centered AI tools in primary health care. Currently, she is leading several projects in primary healthcare, including an international SPOR CIHR funded project on the use of AI for cardiovascular disease management among women. Her work as principal investigator has been funded by Fonds de Recherche du Québec, Santé, FRSQS, Natural Science and Engineering Research Council of Canada, NSERC, Roche Canada. Boudouche Foundation, Switzerland, and a Strategy for Patient-Oriented Research, SPOR, Canadian Institute of Health Research, CIHR. By that, 
It's our great pleasure to invite her to share her screen with us and uh, start her presentation. Thank you so much. Uh, you're muted, you're, you're muted. Hello, can you hear me now? Yes, yes. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much for the invite and for this great uh, seminars that you are uh, organizing during this COVID time that everyone, it's a perfect way to for students and researchers to know more about the, the, the field and different researchers work. So it's a pleasure for me to be here. I'm going to share my screen. Mohsen, can you stop sharing? So I, can you hear, can you see my screen? Uh, not yet. Not yet? We can. Can you see now? Yes. Okay, and can you see my slides as well? Yes. Okay, awesome. Thank you. So I'm gonna start uh, with uh, my presentation. But before going there, I, I would like to uh, disclose uh, that I have no actual or potential conflict of interest in relation to this talk. And also I would like to begin by acknowledge that the land on which McGill is based on is traditional territory of Kidian Kahaka Mohawk, a place which has long served as a site of meeting and exchange among nations. And we recognize and respect the Kenyan Kohaka, the traditional custodians of the land and water on which I present today. And also I would like to acknowledge the support that my research lab uh, receives from these uh, organizations and funding agencies. We are grateful for the support that we receive, with, uh, which without these supports, uh, our research activities uh, were, weren't possible. And a little bit about uh, family medicine department and where we are based in. Well, actually, family medicine department is uh, uh, not based in a uh, main campus of uh, McGill, but a little bit further and more closer to the teaching side. So we have nine teaching sites, clinical sites that uh, our residents be trained in and six of them that you can see in this picture and the, the, um, the, 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 the one that you see here is the place that family medicine department is based on. We are close to the two hospitals, mainly St. Mary's Hospital, uh, that um, I do collaborate with many of clinicians over there and my colleagues over there, and also Jewish General Hospital, where uh, I am based on as, as a affiliated scientist. We do lots of research and collaboration, mainly with the Herzl Family Practice Center over there. Um, so before joining family medicine department and, and during my PhD, I was mainly focusing on uh, data science and methodological development, development of the, the different methods for facilitating decision-making process for clinicians and patients. Mainly I was working on the rehab center uh, in Quebec, for instance, uh, where uh, our focus was to develop a decision support system to facilitate prioritization of patients with communication difficulties uh, and uh, having facilitated the access to to the services for these uh, for these patients over there. And then I was also working on orthopedic surgery ward and uh, facilitating developing decision support system for facilitating decision making in that ward. And uh, also in, in another setting for uh, early uh, detection of rheumatoid arthritis using uh, different AI methods that um, it was an international collaboration with different uh, expertise uh, such as rheumatologists, orthopedic surgeons, software experts, et cetera, from different countries, including Spain, Canada, and Iran, with developed a decision support system using AI method for assessing uh, uh, or for uh, um, early detection of the rheumatoid arthritis. So our algorithm contained two parts, mainly human part and the machine part, which were based on the expert's knowledge. Uh, 
uh, and medical history that we got from the patients and um, and we developed our system based on that. So we uh, got uh, quite a good accuracy rate for this model that we developed. And currently in my lab, we are expanding that model based on quantum learning methods and developing a decision support system based on this model integrated in a web site or web-based application. And other than that, uh, previously, I had the pleasure to collaborate with a uh, excellent team in family medicine department in the University of Laval, uh, where I was working as a family medicine, uh, during my family medicine fellowship for three years over there on a larger scale genomic project called Pegasus. And our goal was to see how we can implement shared decision making in clinical practice regarding prenatal screening for genetic problems such as Down syndrome. Uh, that is where uh, we, uh, we worked on different aspects, including development of the patient decision aid to facilitate decision-making problem for patients and helping this uh, pregnant woman to decide which uh, Down syndrome prenatal testing is more appropriate for them based on their values and, and uh, based on their preferences and latest medical evidence. And also we worked on survey of healthcare professionals, training of healthcare professionals, and uh, some educational uh, videos. And this is a patient decision aid that uh, we worked on and it, uh, this patient decision aid met the eight, 16 out of 16 uh, it does criteria, which is the international patient decision aid standards and have been presented to experts, women and Quebec Ministry of Health. And we got really good uh, feedback from them related to this uh, patient decision aids. And also we, in another uh, project, we wanted to see uh, how acceptable and how usable is this patient decision aids uh, among women and, uh, and their partner. So we started this uh, project and um, conducted uh, qualitative research among 39 couples in three sites in Quebec City and assess the accessibility, uh, acceptability and usability of uh, this double patient decision aids. And we got really good uh, results based on that and we found that it's more acceptable and uh, helpful and useful for a pregnant woman to use this patient decision aid. So you can read more about this, um, the result of our study in this paper that recently published and continuing to that work, we wanted to uh, integrate this patient decision aid in mobile application and see how we can um, facilitate decision making or share decision making process among uh, women related to Down syndrome prenatal screening using this mobile application. So we started up for we uh, project uh, and uh, it has three main phases. We, we conducted need assessment, developed our analytical model and um, and uh, it's ongoing project and we are in the last stage of this project. So you can, if you are interested to know more about this project and, and uh, details of the uh, analytical models, so you can uh, read this uh, paper that we published uh, recently. And um, continuing to that, I was also interested to, to see how we can, um, you know, facilitate um, shared decision making by uh, by doing some educational activities. So I started my um, the activities to facilitate uh, shared decision making by educating or developing illustrative videos and um, conducting some um, workshops, CPD workshops uh, for uh, clinicians, for residents, and also medical students to know more about shared decision making, to know more about um, to know more about patient-centered care, and how they can uh, put it in practice in their clinical uh, practice. Uh, so my in my research lab, we are mainly focusing on on the intersection of the smart technology and. Uh, such as uh, technologies such as AI and how we can use it uh, in order to facilitate evidence-based value 
informed decision making uh, and in its intersection in clinical practice in primary healthcare. So we put patient and community in center of our research. We collaborate closely with patient and and um, patient partners as well as caregivers in different projects. So if you are interested to know more about the, the activities of our research team, you can go to the uh, lab's website at immunslab.ca and know more about the project, publication, etc. Um, so with that being said, I uh, since the, the main topic of this um, series uh, is the subject is translational research, I would like to talk a little bit about the um, the, the translational research and uh, highlight this work that has been published in JAMA several years ago related to how we can bring um, the study and research from bench side to bedside and, and then practice and apply it in, in real practice and where our research work uh, fits in, in, in my research team, where our research fits among these different roadmaps. So as you see, um, we, we start the, the research work with the basic science research and conduct some case, set, a case series in clinical trials, phase one and phase two, and then translate this research to humans and conduct some human clinical research uh, through phase three clinical trials and other sort of observational study and see what is the, the result of our research and then if everything is uh, is uh, okay, we can go to the clinical practice and uh, and uh, conduct some practice-based research using and disseminate the results and using implementation science research as well as developing guidelines uh, and conducting systematic review, et cetera. So the type of research that uh, is ongoing in my research lab is mainly focused on the practice-based research. We are interested to see how we can, how we can um, basically implement, how we can put into practice all of these amazing methodologies developed and all of these decision support systems that's developed in clinical practice in primary healthcare and then evaluate its uh, its, uh, its efficacy, evaluate how it is effective in, in clinical practice and uh, move forward with, uh, with that and see what are the facilitators and barriers of using that and so on. So, um, so this is the type of uh, research work that's ongoing and we translate research both into clinicians and patients in my research lab. We have different ongoing research. Uh, currently, we're focusing on uh, the cardiovascular disease with, uh, by developing explainable intelligent models or explainable AI models for cardiovascular disease management among women in primary healthcare. This is one of the research ongoing in my lab, um, which is supported by CIHR. And we have also an, another research work, which is uh, related to the dementia care. And our goal is to see how we can use the activities and the data related to the activities of the, the, the patients in order to identify if somebody going to have uh, the dementia more specifically MCI and early Alzheimer's disease um, using these data and AI. So mainly the work that spring done in eight project is signal processing related work. And um, we have other projects related to the mental health care, which is how we can improve mental health care among adults and using AI. This is closely being done in collaboration with Herzl uh, Family Practice Center's adolescent uh, clinic. Um, we are co uh, working with psychologists and other healthcare providers in this project. And we have also a project related to how we can use the AI for efficient community based primary healthcare, which I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, part of the result of this research review and uh, the result that we obtained from our systematic scoping review. And we have a project related to the COVID 19 and how we can. Uh, how are you using, uh, you know, AI uh, to early identify and calculate the severity of COVID-19 in nursing homes? 
So uh, before going to the to the to the other section, I right, just wanted to give you a little bit introduction on primary healthcare, which um, I, you, some of you might not be familiar with what's primary healthcare and why it is important. So uh, here I'm going to explain a little bit about the importance of primary healthcare. Um, as uh, so, primary healthcare is the first contact of the patient with healthcare system, and it plays an important role in our healthcare system. It focuses on the way that health services are delivered from birth to uh, first to best, which means that it covers range of care from prenatal care to elderly care, and it's across the continuum of the care and in all settings. So, as you see, it focuses on healthy living part and prevention of the disease, diagnosis of the disease, treatment, and as well as the home care. So primary health care is a society-wide approach to health that incorporates health care delivery from a personal to community level. And uh, in addition to providing a comprehensive health care, primary health care also identified essential, uh, as an, uh, identified as an essential aspect for the formulating evidence-informed public health policies. So this is very interesting a study that recently published in Journal of uh, General Internal Medicine and discussed 10 distinct problem uh, spaces and the most uh, promising uh, AI uh, innovation in each of these aspects and uh, estimates how AI could augment quadruple aim of the care uh, leading to better patient outcome, leading to it, reducing the cost, uh, improving uh, patient experience, as well as improving care providers' experience. Uh, so as you see, uh, it focuses on the diagnosis part, on the chart review documentation part that uh, is related to the uh, provider's well-being, as well as improving patient experience. It uh, covers aspects related to the patient, including the triaging the patient and uh, device integration and aspect, uh, the aspects related to the healthcare system and uh, doing the risk predictions and interventions related to that, identifying which, um, which community might be at higher risk of a specific disease and also aspects related to the population health management. So on the other hand, we are seeing a lot of advancement in AI side and in deep learning and machine learning, more specifically in deep learning area. And we see um, some uh, discussions in terms of the deep learning that will be uh, deep learning can overcome and uh, anything and will be able to do everything in this area, which uh, despite uh, some of researchers who think deep learning can do anything, I am a strong believer that AI cannot just be machine learning or deep learning, and we cannot base all of the assumptions and predictions based on only extensively data-driven approach such as deep learning. So in many contexts, such as uh, some contexts in healthcare, we do not have that extensive and high quality data to use deep learning. So um, I believe we need to go beyond deep learning and do not focus on only deep learning approaches, but do consider deep learning as one of the many approaches that we can use and also consider other uh, approaches and do not focus on deep learning and finding solution for all of the problems by focusing on deep learning. but discovering other methods and hybrid methods as well. So um, so the term AI might be confusing as uh, there is a, no specific definition on that. And this is one of the challenges among the researchers. And sometimes I see people using the term AI and machine learning exchangeably, which means uh, we need to increase the awareness around AI. And this is a great diagram by um, uh, Gary Marks, a good friend and colleague of mine who uh, presented in his book, Rebooting AI, making it clear that there are many other uh, machine learning techniques that, than deep learning, and there are many other areas of AI than machine learning that we are currently focusing on. And this, uh, 
Of course, this is not a comprehensive diagram, but this is a good start to um, to increase the knowledge that we are not uh, AI is not equal to deep learning. And also, uh, Gary talked uh, in his uh, uh, one of in his uh, papers called "The Next Decade in AI." That um, in this Venn diagram that is from his paper um, talks about the the aspects that some of the methodologies are missing in in AI part. For instance, CNNs uh, that are trained by back propagation are missing the, the causal reasoning, are missing the temporal reasoning, are missing the physical reasoning and psychological reasoning. So uh, there are different methods that are not perfect in everything, uh, but we need to be aware of different aspects and do not, as I mentioned earlier, do not focus on one specific method, but try multiple methods in our studies. So I really recommend you uh, to you all to, if you are interested in AI and want to know more about the uh, recent works and, and uh, limitations of these methods, so you can go to the, go and read uh, Gary's uh, paper and also book. So we're going back to the healthcare system, as I mentioned, um, we are in AI side, we are focusing on a um, large number of the data sets and how uh, we can use them to train our model in deep learning and so on. But we are, when we are going to clinical practice and in our clinics and in hospitals, we are still using uh, some old fashioned methods. We are still using facts in our healthcare system. We are still uh, scanning patients evaluation and uploading them on the system. So the data set that is uh, available in our uh, in our clinical settings are not perfect, and we need to improve that and improve the quality and quantity of the data set that we have in our clinical setting. So, um, so in order to to know more about what has been done on on use of AI, different AI methods in um, in primary healthcare. We started this international project called Intelligent Care Project, and um, we wanted to know uh, what has been done in this area. What are the uh, what are the outcome of use of AI in this uh, in this uh, primary healthcare setting? What are the potential risks, and uh, how we can mitigate those risks? What are the facilitators and barriers, and so on? So we started this project in um, about two three years ago. And we can, we started with one of the uh, one of the phases of the, this project, which was a systematic scoping review on use of AI in community-based primary healthcare. So, uh, so we wanted to know the scope uh, that uh, that uh, this AI work has been done in primary healthcare. We conducted the systematic scoping review, which was informed by Joanna Briggs. Uh, Institute scoping review frameworks and the Prisma extension for the scoping review uh, reviews reporting guideline, and we published a protocol of the, the study at JPI. If you are interested, you can uh, read more about the details of this uh, over there. And in the following the slides, I'm going to explain you about the um, briefly about this review work and what we uh, obtain from that. So our specific research question in this systematic review was that what type of AI intervention has been tested or implemented in community-based primary healthcare? What are the effects of these in intervention on the outcomes related to individuals, uh, patients, caregivers, et cetera? What are the outcomes related to the healthcare providers and what are the outcomes related to the healthcare system? Also, we wanted to know what are the facilitators and barriers of use of AI in community-based primary healthcare. For instance, um, uh, barriers related to the healthcare system, barriers related to the uh, individual level as well. And so, uh, an information specialist in, uh, informed uh, informed by by the, the protocol that we provided uh, performed a comprehensive search from the date of inception until February 22 on seven academic databases that you can see here uh, these different databases that we conducted our research on. 
and um, you can find more about the details of it in these two uh, platforms in GBI and Open Science Framework. So uh, our main population of the study uh, was all of the, the, the care providers and all of the individuals who receive care in community-based primary health care. And we wanted to know AI interventions that were implemented or tested in community-based primary health care. And in terms of the comparison, we were not uh, limiting our study on the, on the comparison. And in terms of the outcome, we were interested to know more about the outcomes related to the patient, health-related health outcome, quality of the life. In terms of healthcare providers, we wanted to know the adherence to, uh, to the guideline. We wanted to know if, if the AI, use of AI had impact on the workload of the, uh, the care providers and so on. And in terms of the setting, we were focusing on all of this, uh, all in community-based primary healthcare setting and the studies for all of the type of studies that were included in our review. So uh, this uh, PRISMA flowchart shows the, the result of the, the number of the papers that we obtained. So uh, the two reviewers independently screened the title and abstract of all uh, retrieved references in the first level of screening, and then they did the second level of the screening of the full text, which was um, about the, um, uh, which was about 979 papers. And then uh, in case of disagreement between the two reviewers regarding the selection, a third reviewer was consulted and resolved the conflict. So we retrieved two, uh, 22, around 22,000 documents. And after removal of the duplicates, we got 16,000 documents. And finally, we got 90 studies that met our inclusion criteria. So I'm gonna explain you about the details uh, of the, uh, these 90 included papers on use of AI in community-based primary healthcare. As you see in this um, figure, the majority of the publications has been like the number of the publication has been increased gradually uh, after around uh, 2015 2016 and uh, the majority of the work that has been done was in united states was in united kingdom and then china australia and canada so majority was uh, in, in in these countries um north america europe or china so um, we also looked into the aim of those studies. How many of those the studies describe and evaluated or implemented a novel AI model, and how many use the off-the-shelf uh, AI model and then implemented it in, in in this setting? So about eighty-two percent of the uh, of the studies reported on using and evaluating or implementing of an off-the-shelf AI model, and only eighteen percent. Uh, describe development of the new AI model and then implementing it in community-based primary healthcare setting. And the most commonly used method, so as you see here in this figure, um, the um, expert system started to be used uh, early 1997, 2000, and then um, uh, the level of use of this expert system was low. And then it started to increase again uh, sometime around 2019-18. Uh, the hybrid methods has been increased gradually, and we see a lot of uh, papers has been developed on, on uh, that use hybrid methods. And also neural networks, as you see here, uh, the use of neural networks has been increased recently. Natural language processing, which we can see a lot of work that has been done recently in terms of use of natural language processing by evaluating or analyzing the data that we have in EMRs, um, random forest method, as well as logistic regression, SVMs, and um, and a couple of uh, work that has been done on KNN models and market models. And Bayesian networks um, 
who was used sometime around 2012, 2010, but then they stopped using patient networks. Okay, so uh, in terms of the performance, we evaluated also the performance of, um, of uh, we analyzed and, and extracted the data related to the performance of these AI models and uh, the accuracy percentage uh, of those models was some, uh, something around 65% till 91% and AUC was 66 to 89. And among the, the DZ study, the highest accuracy was reported related to the neural networks, abductive networks, uh, mainly and conditional random fields and convolutional neural network or CNN, which got some accuracy around 90%. And we also observed uh, in our review that there were very poor reporting in terms of the performance measures. And which was disappointing because close to the 40 percent of the studies didn't report the performance of their model that they used and um, that the performance that they uh, obtained as i mentioned here between 65 to 91 and 66 to 89 was the performance that will avail uh, that that is something important to consider that this performance was for the available data set uh, uh, that we uh, that they were used that model for in that specific clinical setting so we cannot generalize that and in terms of the the disease type of the disease that they focused on as you see here majority of the the, the papers are focused on the cardiovascular disease infectious disease diabetes uh, and ortho so there were also some papers that didn't mention exactly uh, on, on the type of the disease that they focused on, or they were uh, focusing on other, other aspects than, than the disease versus operational aspects. So uh, we also was interested to know how, uh, how um, users was involved in, in this in, in this uh, studies on AI and community-based uh, primary healthcare, uh, as you see here, the left one, the left uh, pie chart shows the the involvement of the users or the percentage of involvement of the users in the development stage, and the right chart uh, shows the involvement of the user in testing and validating these stages. And uh, two of the 90, uh, 90 studies that were included, almost 22% reported about uh, AI developers, which were engineers, and none of the studies reported involvement of end users, including healthcare providers or patients in the development stages. And in terms of the testing and validation, we found that seven of the 90 papers reported information about those who participated in testing or validating the AI and uh, and and uh, the, the healthcare professionals were uh, either general practitioners or nurses, engineers, general uh, practitioners again, and also the occupational therapists uh, and so on. So as you see, the number of the user involvement is very low. In those included papers, and uh, this is very interesting um, work that uh, has been recently published by uh, by you and et al. in two, 2021. So they they focus on different waves of how AI uh, uh, how AI do consider perspective related to human computer interactions and uh, what has been done in terms of consideration of the user's need in the first wave of the AI, which was sometime around 1974 to 1980. And, uh, and then in the second wave of the AI, that again, they think user's needs was not satisfied in this time zone. And then recently that started um, in 2011 till current, which is the third wave of use of AI. And they're starting to provide useful and problem solving AI system which uh, do satisfy users' need and, and 
consider those aspects related to the users. But also they highlighted that um, what, what are the differences between non-AI based automated systems and also AI based automated system and how and how what are the difference with disregard and why we we cannot consider him, simple human centered or simple user centered approaches that was developed for non AI automated systems for AI based automated system and why it is important to focus on and um, use more user centered approaches that focuses on AI based system and we can, how we cannot why we cannot use the non AI based uh, approaches that is user centered based or user design approaches that is mainly developed for non AI based uh, systems. Um, so this table also shows the details about the included papers uh, that uh, did consider or did report on the sample size of the patient and healthcare providers. As you can see, only 79 of the papers, um, of the 90 papers are reported on the, on the sample size of the patient and 17 reported on the sample size of the, the, the healthcare providers. And we wanted to know more about the uh, about the details related to consideration as a uh, consideration of sex and gender, uh, as well as um, different aspects related to, to the social demographic information and ethnicity. So we did an detailed analysis on those aspects and we found that only 42% of those um, papers that did report on sample size reported on the sex distribution, none of them considered gender aspects. And in terms of the social demographic information, only 27% reported on the social demographic information. So I'm gonna explain a little bit later in the upcoming slides why it is important to consider and report aspects related to sex and gender and social demographic information and ethnicity in healthcare setting and in health related research. And in terms of the in terms of the ethnicity, in our review, we observed that eighty percent of the, about eighty percent of the included per, uh, included the study didn't report on ethnicity. And among those which did report, majority of the patients' data were related to the Caucasian population. So this can cause definitely representation bias in the AI models and um, perhaps evaluation as well as the algorithmic bias. So eventually the AI system that they uh, are developing might intentionally or unintentionally discriminate against the marginalized and vulnerable population and, uh, and the outcome will not be desirable for all of the, uh, all of the population. Um, so, uh, so sex and gender represents relevant sources of the variation in clinical conditions and affect different aspects, including the prognosis, including symptomology, manifestation, and treatment effectiveness. So previous uh, studies reported the evidence of sex and gender differences in many chronic diseases, including cardiovascular disease. And as you see in this uh, study that is uh, developed uh, by uh, that is uh, has been done by uh, Creelo in and published in Nature recently highlighted the different aspects and uh, that is important and that is influential for instance aspect related to the sex and gender aspect related to the social and economical environment that directly could affect on the physical and mental health and well-being outcomes. And as I showed in previous slide in our review, we found that only for around 40% described the sex distribution of the patients and none of them reported on the gender uh, related uh, indicators. Um, so the definition of the diversity, fairness and measurements related to the inclusion of can receive very very little attention within computer science and in engineering, unfortunately, 
And um, this is a very good paper that I encourage you all to take a look into if you're working on, on AI and would like to know more about this aspect. Uh, that is uh, written by Margaret Michelle, ex-Google AI scientist, and uh, which defines matrices for inclusion. Um, and they focus on the general problem of se selecting a set of instances from a larger set and formalizing how each set might be scored for diversity and inclusion and how we can aggregate and choose preferable set uh, from those uh, larger data set that we do have and so on. And um, gender and ethnic aspect, as I highlighted uh, earlier, is very important to, to be considered and uh, had previously has shown that the fact the performance of of uh, facial analysis algorithms, particularly uh, facial recognition methods, perform better for male and for persons with lighter skin tones, and differences in performance between a light skinned male and dark skinned female, as has been shown to be ranged between 30 to 35 percent points, which is a huge number. And this is very important in AI health domain because, for instance, uh, consider that you are developing an AI model and developing a clinical decision support system that will help clinicians to find out the best treatment for patients with skin cancer. And uh, the algorithm is uh, predominantly trained on Caucasian patients and or light skin patients. And thus the AI software that will likely give less accurate or even inaccurate recommendations for uh, subpopulations for which they uh, they train the data set and and it's it's it will not give a proper result for for instance African American women uh, which the data set was not trained on and. Um, it, the results will be inaccurate. So um, this is also another table that uh, that uh, Carolillo highlighted in in their paper, and as the highlighted aspects related to different biases that uh, might exist in AI health studies, and uh, very interesting work. And they recommend that all of uh, like all of these biases should be considered. For instance, the historical bias, a representation bias, which could occur because of the type of the data set that we have, measurement bias that we when we are considering, uh, you know, specific or favoring specific uh, our ideal features and labels, aggregation bias. Um, and evaluation bias and algorithmic bias. So I, I really recommend you to take a look into this paper as well um, if you are working on AI health work and be attentive on different potential biases that might happen in, in, in training and development and then testing and validation of your model. Um, so we also look into the risk of bias in, in, in our included papers in our review. So we use the ProBOST tool uh, and evaluated uh, or analyzed the risk of bias among the studies that were eligible to be evaluated using ProBOST tool. So about 54% of the studies were eligible to be evaluated by ProBOST tool. And, um, among those 49 papers or 40 uh, or 54 percent of all of the, the studies we found that um, 39 out of 49 or 80 percent at the highest risk of bias according to our assessment which is a huge number and the lowest risk was observed in the participant category and the highest one was in um, outcome category. So a uh, high risk of bias implies that the performance of these AI models in new data sets might not be as good as it was reported in, in these papers. And also we wanted, we looked into the barriers and challenges that, um, we, that they mentioned in these papers and 
um, that the aspects related to the data and aspects related to the AI, for instance, the complexity of the system or difficulty in interpreting the results was one of the main aspects. In terms of data, they highlighted aspects related to the insufficient data and uh, poor quality of the data that they had, as well as the variability in the data set that they had. So, in summary, the observation that we had was that majority of the studies had unclear study design. They didn't highlight the inclusion exclusion criteria for their population they, uh, and also other aspects. They didn't highlight the, uh, or they didn't consider representative selection of the patient. For instance, in terms of the sex, in terms of the gender, in terms of ethnicity, social demographic information, and so on. They had really poor reporting on the data set, which is uh, sad to see. And um, they, they didn't mention how the data were collected, when they collected the data, if they were using electronic health records, which was the last observation from electronic health records. Uh, or EHRs, uh, where the, the knowledge uh, involved in the model development or, or, or how did they involve the experts' knowledge in the model development, and also what was the reasonable number of the participants, and if they did uh, include the participants, or did they consider all of the participants in the data analysis or consider part of it? Were there any missing data? If they were missing data, how did they handle this missing data? Which none of the, which uh, very rarely among those papers uh, that were we evaluated provided information in terms of the missing data and how did they handle this information? In terms of the performance measures that they evaluated they uh, poorly reported on those aspects in terms of the the uh, the model performance. If they considered the overfitting aspects in terms of the validation, did they consider internal validation, which focuses on the same population, or and or did they consider external validation, which refers to the aspects related to the new population? Um, and also the other aspect was uh, related to the clinical needs and the development of AI model, which I, I think this is very important aspect to consider. For instance, a recent systematic review of the studies on AI aided lung imaging for COVID-19 that recently published in, in Patterns believe that there is a mismatch between what AI developers are focusing on and what clinicians really need. So they found that majority of the models focusing on diagnosis, while what is needed really is the prognosis aspect. And uh, comparing clinical articles with the AI articles, they find that uh, they find these disparities. And they found that 84% of the clinical studies use CT data, only 39% uh, percent of the AIs, which AI studies focused on. And most of the AI studies uh, uh, focused on X-ray data, which uh, in clinical studies, they only use 10%. So being intentional about these uh, mismatching AI models uh, to the problem is very important. And uh, it's it's very important to to focus on, on the problem first, not uh, fit the fit the problem to the AI model, but also focus on the problem first, and then develop the AI model for that specific problem. Um, so this is the the result of the, the this is the paper that I just talked about. about some of the results of this paper uh, will be available in a, in about one week, so you can uh, take a look into the, the study if you are interested to know more about the systematic scoping review. So I will skip this part as we will not have enough time. Um, I wanted to talk about the COVID-19 project that's ongoing in my lab. So I'll skip this part because of lack of time. 
and the work that has been done by my students in the lab on developing machine learning and deep learning models uh, for COVID-19 and development of the dashboard. And uh, finally, take home messages. So um, what is very important to consider when you are doing AI health research is that to consider uh, if you are using the high quality data and also in the clinical setting, we need to be more uh, careful about the, the way that we are collecting the data to make sure that we have less noisy and high quality data sets available. We, uh, it's very important to consider the representative data. So to consider if we are considering all of the you know, uh, population, the different ethnicity, um, are we considering different sex and gender aspects, and we have representative data when we are training the model. Uh, in terms of the open science aspects, it's very important that we do consider the aspects related to the um, you know, sharing the data sets, sharing the AI models, uh, sharing the codes, and we are focusing on the on the AI methods. Just do not focus on machine learning and only deep learning AI models, but consider and be open to different models. So uh, sometimes very simple models work very well in, in some problems. So we, we don't need to focus on very complicated uh, models or deep learning models. And um, in my opinion, the best way, one of the best way to proceed is to use hybrid models. And um, very important to be careful about the way that we are reporting our, our research work in the papers in terms of reporting on, on AI development, reporting on the, the performance of those AI methods in terms of the reporting on the data sets that we use and so on. And very important to be attentive to the potential biases that I just talked about and aspects related to involvement of different um, end users, the involvement of patients and clinicians and focusing on or working in, in, in team, in multidisciplinary team than working in silo and developing an AI model that may or may not be useful uh, for, for the uh, problem that exists in that clinical setting. So with that being said, I will finalize my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. If you have any questions about uh, the presentation or any of my research work, so you can feel free to send me an email. And also, if you want to know more about our research, you can go to the website uh, of the lab and know more about our ongoing work. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Rahimi, for your very uh, nice uh, presentation. Uh, uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning is, is a very hot topic these days, and their applications in uh, uh, healthcare system is, is something that is emerging uh, uh, over the uh, over the next few years. Uh, thanks for, for your very nice uh, presentation again and for your thoughts. Uh, so we have time for a few questions. Uh, uh, before we uh, ask the question, I just wanted to remind everyone that uh, we will have uh, uh, Professor Rosenwick from McGill ne next week. Uh, please mark your calendars uh, for the uh, for another exciting talk uh, 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 next week. Uh, 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 make sure that you ask your questions um, using the ask a question box. Uh, 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 so uh, uh, I would like to ask, uh, start with, with asking a few questions myself and break the ice uh, probably for the, uh, for the audience. Uh, so, so what are your thoughts on the application of uh, or applications of the AI based interventions? In, in low resource settings where there probably is not much information available to analyze. Uh, do you see any challenge in, in using these, uh, you know, AI-based technology, uh, AI-based, uh, you know, systems in, in those settings? 
Yeah, very good question, um, uh, Mose. I think one of the one of the aspects that um, is important to consider in these settings is that, um, as I mentioned, to not focus on on only those methods that needs large amount of data and like deep learning is not always solution for everything. So sometimes we can provide um, solution for, for the problem that's ongoing using the knowledge experts and very simpler methods. So that, that's something to, to consider one aspect. And the other one is that depends on how we advance in terms of generalizing or building models or methods that will be generalizable. So if we can train or build our model in 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 uh, countries that are uh, have enough you know resources and computational power, and then transferring it to the, uh, transfer the result or the knowledge to those countries that have lower resources, uh, might be uh, one way to proceed. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So uh, another question that I have is related to uh, to a concern that uh, some people have regarding the, uh, people, machine learning and artificial intelligence in general, and uh, that's the you know training a machine and uh, that at some point it can outsmart us. So. Uh, so, 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 uh, in that regard, there are some concerns uh, around the uh, data security. Uh, so we're you're using patient data, uh, and then you're giving this patient data to a machine. Uh, are there any concerns regarding the data security and challenges associated with that aspect of uh, you know uh, artificial intelligence? Yeah. Uh, that's that's a very good question. When we are going to the um, you know um, the data security aspect, mostly when we have access to the data of the patient, they are it's important to have the anonymized data set. So if we, we will not see the patient's name or detailed information, but we have codes that are assigned for each patient that we usually uh, use, like uh, in my lab, when we are having the data set for let's say. 4,000 patients that we recently received the data is, and we, we don't know their name, so we don't know detailed information about that, but the, the goal is to develop a model um, in with the data sets that's available, but not providing the detail of the, the patients. And the other thing is that we see a lot of improvements uh, or advancement with blockchain and, and data security aspects in, in in, uh, in other fields. So it, mm -hmm. so that's why it's important when uh, we are doing research on, on uh, you know, interdisciplinary areas such such AI health areas so to involve experts from different disciplines and do not work in silos and uh, just with one field, but involve uh, experts from different fields, involve uh, you know, healthcare uh, experts, healthcare providers involved, experts in, in data security, involved experts in uh, data science and AI, involving, uh, you know, patient even that could uh, bring very, um, sometimes they can bring very rich and uh, useful information that we might not know or do not feel that issue when we are building our decision support system, but they can bring us and aware us when we are building or developing our decision system, oh, this aspect is also important to consider from patient perspective because those are the people who are going to use the, the final product at the end, right? Great. So I have, I have a question from the audience, which is a very, very good question, actually. Uh, and very interesting question. So how would you advise for balancing uh, reaching out for end user engagement to help guide research and, and not overburdening providers and patients, especially given COVID-19 additional stress? So that's that's some concern regarding the research aspect of uh, uh, Yeah, very good question. Um, that one. <laughs> It's uh, it's always you know a challenge to you know to to have that um, 
you know, well, how much do we involve them in our research? And we are always having, you know, it's important to have good relationship with our patients so, and also open up a space that they will be able to, uh, to you know, talk and share their concerns. And um, we, we, there are also some guidelines on how to involve patients in the research uh, from sports opportunities, for instance, uh, uh, which is uh, one of the initiatives by CIHR that um, you know, guide and help researchers on how to involve patients. If they are involved in their research, they'll be making sure that they are compensated for their time and the, the, making sure that they are being cared in the meetings that they are involved in. So um, there will be no you know, power relationship in the meetings, but more friendly sort of meetings that they will be able to uh, better engage in the in the in the meetings and in the discussions and providing their feedbacks and providing their uh, you know, the way that they think things are uh, important from their perspective. Yeah, yeah that's fair. That's fair. Uh, so the next question that I have is uh, is around the translational aspect of. Uh, these uh, decision-making algorithms. And I, I'm, I'm curious to know uh, FDA and Health Canada's position on this AI-based, uh, you know, decision-making approaches. Because you talked about the accuracy of some of these uh, techniques. And then, uh, and I wonder what accuracy is, is accepted by the, you know, by these regulatory bodies. Maybe if you can comment on that. So, um, to the best of my knowledge, I'm not aware of any specific accuracies that they did highlight it. And it is something that is, uh, in my opinion, is more case-based, for instance, for, for different uh, purposes or for different tasks or problem, different accuracies might be acceptable. For instance, are we talking about diagnosis and treatment related decisions or are we talking about operational decisions what is the what is the influence or impact uh, of the, the the decision making or the result of the ai system will it will it be the result if something is uh, you know the accuracy is not high and the result um, will not better guide the the you know users Will it be uh, harmful or um, so? It's it's uh, very depend on the type of the, the problem and the type of the mm -hmm. um, the task that we are talking about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But uh, are there any discussions with uh, Health Canada or uh, FDA about this? You know. Uh, AI based practices or AI based uh, you know decision making approaches are they accepted by uh, uh, by the regulatory bodies yeah i i i'm aware of there are some uh, some work are ongoing with uh, some of my colleagues that are involved in mm -hmm. in more national levels in terms of building guidelines not just specifically mm -hmm. for healthcare, but how we can use AI and robotics, what are the important aspects to, to consider. And recently, actually, uh, in European um, Commission, or the, there was a committee, and recently they published a report in, in for European countries that where and uh, where we can, when we can uh, use uh, AI, so they they categorize different aspects. For instance, low risk, medium risk, and high risk. And uh, for instance, uh, emergency department and use of AI in emergency departments was categorized mm -hmm. among the high risk uh, aspects. Mm -hmm. So they they guide specifically what are the important aspects that we need to consider when we are using AI in high risk uh, area. So what are the regulations? What are the um, important aspects related to the data and AI development that we need to consider. Okay. So I'm, I'm yeah. hoping there will be guidelines and, and clear, uh, you know, directions from the national level in terms of 
on, in terms of use of AI in, in Canadian level as well. So. Okay, that's good. That's good. So we have another question from uh, from the audience. Uh, and then, uh, first of all, the audience apologizes because they uh, they joined uh, uh, joined the the talk late, and then uh, you probably answered their uh, this question. Uh, so, do you think uh, explainability is sufficient to establish trust with the providers? If not, what could we do to increase their adoptions? Yeah, I I don't think explainability is enough for for building the trust. It is one way. It is an important way, and it is actually one of the area that. Um, is ongoing area of research that's ongoing in my research lab that how we build this explainable models and um, how do we involve users and what what type of on, on which level of explainability do we need to proceed with so i i don't think explainability is enough for building the trust but it's one of the way if they better understand the result of the algorithm and why did we reach to that um, you know, mm -hmm. conclusion or that outcome based on this AI algorithm is one of the way to increase the trust. But the other way is that really to um, to to pilot test that and and then the do show that well actually this model or this AI algorithm that we use uh, could be effective. And and the most important thing is to involve involve end users in the develop from the early stages in the development stage, not just uh, when we develop the AI algorithm and we want to test it and, and then validate it to, to ask their opinion. But you, involvement, engagement of these end users from early stages could build trust and it is not like one day uh, you know, approach, it, it builds through the, the process and by involving those patients and clinicians from early stages in the development and then testing and then implement, adopting it in clinical setting and implementing it in clinical setting is, I think, uh, one of the way to proceed to build that trust and and um, in terms of use of AI in health. Okay, that's that's uh, that's fair. Uh, so I have uh, I have no more questions. I really enjoyed your talk. So if uh, Human has any questions, uh, feel free to ask. I have one question, uh, which is really a general question. First of all, thank you very much for the great talk. Uh, so I was reading the book by Yuval Noah Harari, and he's always talking about uh, scary things that in 50 years, uh, some jobs uh, are going are gonna to disappear because of uh, AI and ML. So, and people or, uh, you know, like uh, technicians, workers or other, other you know, <clears throat> professionals, they have to kind of, you know, switch and learn AI uh, to, and if you, you don't have this skill to switch, you're going to be, you know, kind of wipe up <laughs> from, from uh, the job market. So I just want to know your perspective on this. For example, now we have image processing using AI, you know, diagnostic. Uh, so some some pathologists using this AI-based uh, image processing. So I'm just wondering how AI could kind of influence the, the you know, clinician jobs or clinician responsibilities in terms of, you know, let's say pathologists. Is uh, do do we reach a, someday at the point that we don't need a, a pathologist to diagnose a disease? Based or how how do you see the future? Um, yeah, that that's actually a question that I I hear a lot, especially when I'm you know working with clinicians. Do you think we're gonna be replaced by AI and, and machine learning methods, etc.? But I, I I don't think that is the the case. Perhaps um, those clinicians or um, those healthcare providers that um, have knowledge about AI and know how to work with AI methods and AI-based decision support system, etc., will be replaced by those who do not know. But I don't think AI will, will you know, 
uh, they'll be they go to the hospital and there will be only AI, no no clinicians and no healthcare providers because that is what medicine is about. It's 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 human science. It's not it's not um, uh, we cannot replace human by by anything. Well, of course, AI could be helpful, could be useful on augmenting their information, on helping them or assisting them in terms of the early detection of the disease, in terms of which treatment will be um, more suitable for this specific patient or not. So guiding them, helping them, assisting them in the, in the decision-making process. But, um, that aspect of the, the medicine is medicine is human based uh, and human that interaction with human that relationship with patient is very important. I don't think any AI tool could uh, could uh, replace um, that that part of the medicine. And what we really need to focus on as AI developers or AI health researchers that to find a way to help clinicians or build augmented intelligence, not artificial intelligence that will be, uh, that will uh, replace, uh, you know, clinicians. Thank you so much. Uh, Mohsen, I don't have any other question. I'll pass to you. Thank you, Human. Uh, uh, and uh, I'd like to thank our speaker again for uh, for a uh, for very, very nice and uh, interesting presentation. I also would like to thank our uh, participants for joining um, this talk. Don't forget that uh, our uh, uh, next week we will have uh, 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 Professor Rosenwick from uh, McGill University. Uh, he will be talking about uh, 3D bioprinting and its application in musculoskeletal uh, tissue engineering. Uh, uh, with that, I'd like to uh, end uh, our uh, 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 session today and then wish you all having a great uh, day ahead of you. Bye. Bye.